Hi everyone, this is Victor Gitcha. Thank you for watching The Contributors. If you want to learn how to raise money from venture capital funds and how to win Bitcoin jackpot, watch this interview until the very end. My today's guest is a veteran of Silicon Valley tech CEO, Xerox Park alum, partner at the Band of Angels Venture Capital Fund and the holder of over 40 patents. His inventions are used by billions of people. His technology credits include autoplay used by by Windows, Blu-ray players, video game consoles, AirPlay used by Apple TV, LeapPad, Sound Blaster, Flash, the graphical user interface GUI, optical joysticks Sega, Smart Paper, MIT Media Lab, and the movies on demand used by Netflix. During his career, he has successfully raised over $200 million in venture capital from Sierra Ventures, Intel Capital, NTT Japan, and others. He also won over $300 million in intellectual property settlements against most of the world's top software, hardware, and consumer electronics companies including Microsoft, Samsung, and Sony. Peter is a digital media pioneer and is known as the father of the second screen. Peter has a master's in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley, and Institute of Electrical and Electronics. Electronics engineers has judged Redford smart paper used for airplay invention as one of the most important innovations for the new millennium. Please welcome my guest, inventor, investor, and the contributor, Peter Redford. Hi, Peter. Thank you for agreeing to share your life story on The Contributor Show. Pleasure to meet you, Victor, and thank you so much for inviting me. To start off our conversation, I'd like to ask you, what inspired you to become an inventor? What was your first invention? It's always been magical to me that one can start with a blank piece of paper and end up with almost anything that one can visualize. Even as a child, I would dream about having magical powers to make dreams come true. I think these dreams drove me to engineering and ultimately business. Now I can honestly say that dreams do come true. My first commercial invention, was, which I did not patent, was a way to integrate digital logic with CCD camera sensors. And that invention, by the way, got me hired as a researcher at Xerox Park. A short time later, Later, I filed my first graphical user interface patent. This invention got me my first venture capital and enabled development of Flash. That was the beginning. What a story. If I were a Hollywood producer, I would make a movie about it. One of your inventions, the second screen and the most popular application for TV Guide used by all cable TV providers and companies like Microsoft, Apple, Samsung, Sony, and Comcast. How did you come up with this idea and what was the biggest challenge to make it work? Well, that was inspired by my son, Ricky, who was just about a year old at the time. He would point at images and books and expected me to tell him what it was. So we had this visual dictionary. It was like a thousand pages thick. Macmillan published it and it had like a million pictures in it. And he would, his favorite activity was to point at these pictures, usually when I was really busy, and, and just expect, expect me to say like giraffe, elephant, fire engine, you know, things like that. Uh, so, and this will go on for hours. So to solve this problem, I created the leap pad. With the leap pad, a child could touch an image in a physical picture book and a video on a computer screen would explain what it was. So I didn't have to do it. Biggest challenge to make this work at the time was that the video associated with the book was stored on a CD. To start a CD, it required a complicated process with many keyboard keystrokes and mouse clicks and something that a child could not do. So again, you know, to solve this problem, I created created autoplay. You know, in this case, the child would simply insert the CD into the computer's drive and the program on the C started automatically. So book with the images could be displayed on an iPad or on a smartphone. And when that happened, uh, this became known as the second screen. The TV became the first screen. So that, that was how that whole first screen, second screen thing evolved. Well, you know, Ricky would point to a picture of an elephant on a, on a book page and immediately, which was either a physical book that had touch sensitive pages or it could be let's say on an today it would be like on an iphone or an ipad and immediately i 
up to touching the picture of the elephant in the book, you know, in a printed page or on a touch screen, an associated video would play on a big TV screen. Well, when, it's, when I first built it, it was like a physical book with paper pages. Paper was touch sensitive. So this was part of the invention was that we made the paper touch sensitive. When something on the page was touched, uh, you know, the book would recognize the coordinates of the touch and would transmit it by infrared, just like a TV remote, to a computer. And the computer would play a video, associated video on the computer screen. Wow. So that was was about 20 years ago. Wow. About 2000, uh, it, was it was like 90, 92 or 91, 91 or 92. And we got bunches of patents. That eventually became the leap pad. Very interesting. I always admire the investors. Your brain went very differently from regular people. You won over $300 million in intellectual property settlement against most of the world's top software, hardware, and consumer electronics companies, including Microsoft, Samsung, and Sony. Could you share with us why did you have to sue them and how did you win the lawsuit against such big companies? I heard it's almost impossible. Yes, it is almost impossible. It was extremely difficult then. It's even more difficult now because new case laws over time just keep raising the bar. But there were three critical factors that enabled us to win. The first was our decision to sue. It was necessary to sue because if we simply approached Microsoft or Sony with a request to license our patents, they would immediately sue us for what is called a declaratory judgment or DJ. They won't tell you, of course, ahead of time that they would do that, but of course they will. They, they want you to go to them and tell them, oh, we have this, this patent and you're infringing, you know, but when you do, they will immediately file the DJ. And in effect, we would end up as a defendant and would need to defend ourselves in faraway places like Redmond, Washington or Tokyo. So it was extremely important that none of the infringers like Microsoft or Sony knew that we were infringing, that they were infringing and or that we were even prefer, you know, preparing to file a lawsuit. Uh, the second decision, which was key, was to hire the best IP litigation law firm in the country, which at the time was Robbins, Kaplan, Miller and Cerisi, or RKMC for short. We were located in Minneapolis. Microsoft used Preston Gates and Fish and Richardson. Preston Gates, of course, is uh, Bill Gates' father's law firm. But they wished they had my law firm, which was RKMC. You know, our law firm practically made their lawyers cry. I, I'm not even exaggerating. It was that bad. The critical factor was how we, we negotiated the settlement. Prior to settling, we had several settlement conferences that were forced by the court. Microsoft always showed up pointing their fingers and yelling, we don't owe you a damn penny. You know, so that's, so it wasn't very productive at all. Finally, five years later, three days before our jury trial, Microsoft invited us to dinner and requested a final settlement conference. It was starting to see reality at that point. But I also knew at that point that the gap to settle was was just too big. You know, we were, we were asking for like $3 billion and they were probably going to be asked for like to pay like 10000 <laughs> So when the gap was that big, it's really difficult to settle. So the solution was to make sure that during dinner that we were invited to with them, and it was like five of, our, five of us or six of us and six of them it was a big dinner over at this really nice restaurant in San Francisco. I made sure that I sat next to the head litigator. Uh, his name was Mark Gardman. Even though we were litigating for five years, I never actually met him or talked to him. It was always lawyers to lawyers. Yes. So this is their lead attorney was Mark Gartman. And five years of, of going at it at each other. And we never actually spoke face to face. It was just lawyers to lawyers. So during the dinner, we had the most amazing conversation. And we actually developed a relationship, which, you know, in business, it's always key. Everything happens uh, because of relationships. And right. almost nothing happens when there is no relationship. And the amazing thing was, you know, the next day when we met again in the judge's chamber to negotiate the settlement, we hugged. The judge was like, what's wrong with this picture? So it took about 10 hours to negotiate, to negotiate. And Microsoft kept coming back with numbers, consistently beating our expectations. So, you know, the judge basically put them in one room, put us, put us in another room, and then he would have us write on a piece of paper, you know, what our offer was, you know. So we wrote like $3 billion and we gave it to the judge. He would take it over to the other room. You know, an hour later, he would come back with another piece of paper, which was the counter thousand. offer, which, which was $10,000, you know, right. it's like that. and it just went back and forth. And I kept texting my wife what I thought would their offer would be when they uh -huh. came back. And it was always much higher than what, what I expected and what our attorneys expected. And I am sure that that was due to the relationship. They were no longer thinking like we're a bunch of jerks. Instead, okay, let's, let's settle with these guys. You know, that was probably right. what they were thinking. And 10 hours later, we got our settlement and both sides were happy with it. And I attributed it completely to sitting next to the guy next 
to Mark at dinner. So we got exactly what we agreed to during that conference. It wasn't really the courthouse. It was over in Embarcadero, like a special center for settlements, for settlement conferences. Awesome. But so whatever we, you know, we agreed to at that point is exactly what we got literally a few days later with no additional negotiation needed, you know, just the contract was drafted up. And I think it was just about a week or so. So small amount of time like that. That's incredible. First time in my life I see a real person who wants such a huge loan. So kudos, Peter. Peter, you are an inventor, investor, chairman, CEO, and partner of the oldest and most active early stage venture capital fund in the United States, Band of Angels. What job out of all of I just mentioned is most satisfactory and why? You know, all of those are really things or, or sort of parts of a, a sort of a platform that I need to be able to do what I do, you know, which is sort of creating something from nothing, which is like magic. And I can, I just have to say that I like, I love all of them equally. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like trying to say which is more, which we love more, the stove or the refrigerator. Yeah, like my children. That's actually a very good analogy. Interesting. I thought you would choose an investor. Very cool. I bet during your more than three decades career, you faced a lot of difficulties, rejections and the situations when something was against you or was not the way you want. What is your typical way of dealing with difficult situations? Give us an example. You know, my favorite way to overcome adversity and, you know, there's constant adversity, you know, living on the edge like I do, on the bleeding edge, you know, you spend half your day, everything not working. My favorite way is what I call cruising to solve this or to overcome those adversities is what I call cruising for coincidences. And this actually came out, became sort of a favorite phrase of my friends because they hear this, they go like, wow, that's a fantastic expression. But I really seriously use this. I discovered that solutions to problems often present themselves as coincidences. And this strategy works so well that I act for coincidences by doing things that most people would not do typically or avoid doing. Like, for example, many years ago, the funding for one of my companies was taking such, was taking such a long time Time that I completely ran out of money. And I remember driving home that, that evening thinking like, how am I going to pay for gas? How am I going to pay for food? And the phone rang and it was some telemarketer. You know, normally, uh, and he was trying to sell me a loan. You know, we normally just hang up, but instead I asked him about the terms of the loan. And literally a few days later, I got a $20,000 loan secured <laughs> by my car. And I can write a book about just coincidences like that. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. I can honestly say, most of the really good things that happened to me in my life were completely by coincidence. You know, it was like just, just being in the right place at the right <laughs> time, completely unintentional, unexpected. You go to a party that you don't want to go to and you come back with $6 million because you run into some guy from NTT who just happens to be looking for this kind of a company to invest in, you know? Like somebody invited you to a party you don't want to go to because you think it's going to be a horrible party. I would say, I mean, if you don't have any adversity in your life, maybe don't go. By looking for something, if, if you have some adversity to overcome, go to the party. Very likely, you know, it's very possible that something, you'll meet somebody there or, you know, or you get an idea while you're talking to someone. It's, it's like that. Yeah. So just go to the coffee shop. Don't just sit around home, you know, worrying about it because nothing is going to happen at home, but something may happen in the coffee shop or at the party, you know. This show us your real character. You're one of those who never give up. Today, you are very successful. And when I met you first time, you drove a Ferrari. All successful people I have met have one thing in common. All of them have faced and successfully overcome very serious challenges to become rich and successful. What is your greatest failure story? What did you learn and how did you recover from it? Well, you know, I look at successes and failures as stepping stones equally. You don't necessarily learn more from a success than you learn from a failure or vice versa. A great example of that is Apple's Lisa. That were actually failures. You know, Lisa was a failure. Newton was a failure. But they were stepping stones to the Mac and to the iPhone. So one of my biggest failures, it would turn out not to be a failure, but what appeared at the time to be a disaster. So when I announced to the TVI board, TVI was my company, and it included, the board included Intel and NTT that I was going to sue Microsoft, both board members, both NTT and, T and Intel, immediately resigned from the board, said they could not support this. You know, the NTT guy said, and it was actually the chairman of NTT, he said, oh, Bill Gates is my best friend. You know, I cannot be on the board of a company that's suing Microsoft. You know, we were very close to closing a financing deal, just doing some financial documentation on the many millions of dollars were being invested by Intel and NTT. They canceled the deal on me just oh. because I announced that I was going 
to sue Microsoft. Our lawyers who were at the board meeting laughed at me. You know, they, they said I was, you know, I was crazy to even consider suing Microsoft. So I fired the lawyers right afterwards. Before the meeting was over, I sensed an opportunity. So first I asked the, the chairman of NTT when he said he couldn't support this. I said, does that mean that he wants to resign? Does that mean that you want to sell your stock, your TVI stock, back to TVI? Because, you know, they both invested millions of dollars in TVI. So I said, do you want to sell stock back to TVI? So he said, how much will you pay? How much do you offer to buy it back? So I talked to my team and, you know, one of my board members who was a venture capitalist said, oh, I can come up with a million dollars. You know, they really want to sell it back to you really badly. Even though they invested many, many millions of dollars, they will probably sell it back to you for a million. Wow. So I said, well, you know, if they sell it back to me for a million, why don't I just, they, they'll probably sell it to me for 10,000. Oh, I'm glad you get to say that with a straight face. But we went back to the room and I said 10,000. Then we had one of those meetings with Japanese executives, sort of famous for pregnant pauses, you know, like, you know, where you, somebody says something and then there was like a few minutes sometimes of silence. Yeah. So we had like a really, literally a 10 minute pregnant pause. It was a video call, you know, with, with Japan. 10 minutes later, the Japanese chairman says, okay, so I got 12% of my company back for $10,000. And then I said to Intel, that was subsequently on the telephone. So a few days later, Intel called me and said, okay, we want to sell our stock back to you as well. So I said, well, you know that I bought it back from NTT for $10,000. And he goes, oh, yes, I do. So it's $10,000 then, right? And I said, well, no, because they owned 12% of the company. You own 8% of the company. They're also, they paid you know, a dollar fifteen per share. You pay two dollars and fifty cents per share. So I did a quick calculation, literally on a napkin. You know, it was like a little ratio of calculations, and came out to six thousand four hundred. I said, "Well, for you, it's six thousand four hundred." So he said, "Deal." And then he said he's going to put together an agreement, and and we hung up. And I'm thinking, you know, and remember, my financing just fell through, so I was not like flush with cash. So I thought, you know, I can use that six thousand four hundred dollars for something. You know, I wonder how much it would. So I called them back. Before that happened, he called me back the next day and he says, the Intel board thinks that there's too much value. They can't just place, pay $6,400 for 8% of the company, but they would be willing to do it if you included 300,000 warrants. Warrants are like, you know, basically shares of agreements to buy shares of stock at a certain price for a certain period of time. So I said, 300,000 share warrants, sure, I can do that. And then we hung up again. And then I'm thinking, I wonder how many more warrants it would take to make it $1 instead of 6400 So I called him back, asked him, then he got back to me. He says, throw in another 100,000 warrants and we can do it for $1. It's exactly the same as an option. It's an option to buy our stock, a certain number of shares. In this case, it was 300,000 shares at a pre-agreed price. So our shares, so, you know, let's say five years later, we go public and the shares are selling for $200 a share, but they are able to still pay a dollar a share. Exactly. The really important thing about that was that that because, especially in the case of Intel, because they owned the entire Series D, you know, they had special rights. They could veto. I had to ask for permission for almost anything I wanted to do. Anything I wanted to do, I needed their permission. They had veto power. Buying them out completely like this for one dollar, I ended up not having them, these guys standing constantly standing in the way. And so my life became a lot less complicated. Yeah, this is a story. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you. If you want to learn how to raise money from venture capital funds and how to to win Bitcoin jackpot. Watch this interview until the very end. If you like this interview, please like and share. If you want to be notified about my upcoming guests, subscribe and click the bell. Institute the Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, has judged your smart paper airplay invention as one of the most important innovations for the new millennium. Could you tell us what is airplay, where it is used now, and how did you invent it? You know, airplay was a natural extension of the lead pad. And that evolution happened after physical books migrated to the second screen. And when I mean by second screen, it would be the second screen of the iPhone uh, or the iPad. Airplay is very powerful. It's a very powerful concept because it literally turns the second screen 
into a dynamic TV remote. It enables TV programs to be selected just by touching their titles. So, so you have a TV guide displayed on an iPad or an iPhone, and you browse the TV guide or whatever, you know, you're looking at all the titles of all the different movies, for example, on Netflix mm -hmm. uh, or on YouTube. And when you see one that you want to watch, all you have to do is touch the title and it immediately then plays on the big screen, on your big TV screen. So you may be sitting on the couch with your whole family and, you know, your iPad or your iPhone is like a TV remote from which you select the title of the movie you want to watch just by touching it. So it, it's very direct. It's very revolutionary. You know, traditional remote controls were very indirect, a very, very elementary and important invention. Well, no, right. it has to be on TV the guide. second screen. It, it's so a... the TV guide has to be on the second screen, right? which would be, on, these days, it would be the iPad or the iPhone or sorry, the smartphone. Right. So the second screen is always referring to like a mobile device. And the first screen is always referring to the TV that's hanging on your wall. Wow. This is an incredible invention. Can't believe I'm talking to its inventor right now. One of the world's biggest Japanese multinational video game and entertainment company, Sega Incorporation, uses your invention optical joystick. Who else using this invention? How did you get an idea of optical joystick? And what was the challenges to make the world's first optical joystick? So in the 80s and early 90s, video game joysticks were horrible. They used mechanical potentiometers that had extremely, they only had an 8-bit resolution, they, they were sticky, and they were non-linear too. So, you know, if you go from left, from left to right, for example, with the joystick, the, the response would change mm -hmm. with, you know, as you would go, as you were moving. So it was very frustrating. So that is what we experienced as we were working with Sega because we were doing other things with Sega at the time as well. And I was on vacation in Hawaii, just resting under a palm tree. What I noticed was there was like a very tall palm tree next to me. And I noticed as time went by, the shadow that, and, and you know, the sun would move across the sky. I noticed the shadow on the grass next to me would be moving along too. And that, so the tree was like a light gate. And that gave me the idea that you know, what, what would happen if I replaced the palm tree? If the palm tree was the joystick handle and the joystick handle was attached to a light gate and, you know, and I would be shining, the sun would be just an infrared LED shining at this light gate and the ground would be, you know, where the shadow was, be the like, optical sensors, photodiodes. And after the vacation, I went to the lab and I built a joystick like that where I used two infrared LEDs, two infrared photodiodes. And, uh, and I basically detected the light that was reflected from a light gate as the as you moved the handle of the joystick and what i discovered was it was 100% linear it had absolutely no moving parts because the, we were able to mount the, the joystick handle on a spring you know there were no moving parts whatsoever the whole thing was just one piece and we were able to achieve more than 16 bits of resolution so we showed it to sega and they loved it and you know i, I personally designed the prototype of this thing and even laid out the pc board which ended up being the pc board that they used in the final product. It was actually an optional joystick for the Sega Saturn. And we put the firmware to run this into a chip. And so each one of those joysticks came with a chip that we actually sold to Sega. So we made millions of dollars selling these chips, manufacturing these chips and selling them to Sega. And they were manufacturing the joystick. Manufacturing is not really as difficult as it may sound because it was a single chip microcontroller, uh, I think from TI or National. And all we had to do is program it. And then we would uh, send the mask of the program or we would send the code to TI and TI would mask it onto those chips and mass produce them and ship them directly to, to Sega. Yeah, I mean, our cost would be like $1 and it would pay us like $4 for it. So it was very profitable and it was almost like a money machine. So that became sort of the standard way of oh. the joysticks. Right. At this point, our patents already ran out so we can no longer get royalties for it. It's like 17 years. Mm -hmm. It's a little longer now, but those patents were filed, you know, in early 90s. So at the time, it was 17 years. Now it's like 20 or 21. The more I learn about your inventions, the more I admire you. This is mind blown. During your career, you have successfully raised over 200 million in venture capital from Sierra Ventures, Intel Capital, NTT Japan, and others. Could you share with our viewers what three or more important steps need to be made to raise money from VCs? You know, so the obvious thing is that to raise money from VCs, which is not as easy as it may sound, because you only right. hear about the success stories. You don't normally hear about, you know, the people who tried for 10 years and never raised any. A relationship of some sort is really critical. So either you need to have a relationship with some venture funds, some VCs, 
intermediaries or you need to have a relationship with someone who does. A lot of times the trusted intermediary comes into play. VCs very rarely invest in walk-ins. You know, like if you just call some venture fund and say, you know, I have this really great idea. They might listen to it, but it's extremely unlikely that they will take it seriously without somebody in the middle who, who can actually vouch for you. Other than that, I like to have a minimum viable product at the outset, also called an MVP, minimum viable product. Uh, I also like to have a team. I tend to prefer a somewhat more complete team than some other entrepreneurs. A lot of times, you know, that includes, the, of course, the CEO, the CTO, the CMO, which is the chief marketing officer. And if I'm raising a large round, I like to have a CFO as well, because investors like to feel that their money is going to be properly managed. It is also important to have a, a deck that is focused. You know, a big mistake, in fact, hyper-focused on the market that is not yet big enough that it is in the crosshairs of large companies. One of the big mistakes that entrepreneurs make is that they think they need to be fine looking for the largest possible market. And my advice always is, no, no, look for the smallest possible market for your invention or for your the kind of company you're trying to build. Unless, of course, you plan to be acquired almost immediately. You know, another important consideration I would say even a requirement is securing strategic partnerships, both for funding and for deployment. The industry these days is so huge. Technology industry is so huge that almost everything you do, there are going to be huge companies out there trying to run you over. So having a partner like Intel, for example, or NTT or, or Sega, you know, goes a long way both for finance, it really can be really instrumental in getting the money and also later possibly getting acquired. And if you're launching, you know, they could be licensing your technology, they could be protecting you in the marketplace and so on. It's also important for the CEO to be dynamic and humble. The CEO is like a, like a big job. First time CEOs sometimes don't realize that how important it is to be humble. Uh, you know, don't say things like I've been there, done that, because that doesn't sound humble. Also, a lot of times it's not the best product that gets funded. It's the one that looks most beautiful, this mm. shiny object. I know it's not fair, but my advice would be make your product as beautiful to look at as possible. Thank you, Peter, for this first-hand insight. I hope our viewers are making notes. You hold over 40 patents, raise over $200 million, drive Ferrari. How do you evaluate success? Well, for me, it's really simple. To me, success is synonymous with freedom, just freedom. I totally agree. This is what I would call success to. Oh, if your life is too complicated, that's right. not freedom either. Before I do anything, I ask myself, is this going to make my life complicated or more complicated? And if the answer is yes, I don't do it. I simply don't do it. I believe that veteran of Silicon Valley tech CEO should have an extensive mentorship experience. What is your most memorable mentorship experience? I had a few. My favorite one was in 1985, I was interviewing technicians for, for our assembly line, really large uh, computer manufacturing plant in Milpitas. And one of the candidates, his name was Byron, he arrived and told me that he just graduated from high school yesterday and he drove, he drove 400 miles from like Washington, D.C. or something to, to for this interview. And as we were talking for a half hour, he appeared so talented. You know, he was telling me about, about his life and what he did in the past. I got so excited about the guy that my knees were actually shaking under my desk. I just wanted to, to, to jump up and down and tell him, you're hired, you know, you're hired. Of course... <laughs> You know, reverse psychology is, is really important with kids and also in business. So I didn't say that. Instead, I said, um, call you. And uh, then when he left, I asked my secretary to wait 20 minutes and then call him back and invite him for another interview the next day. When he showed up the next day for a second interview, just by coincidence, the manager of the manufacturing plant quit. So Byron is walking in, the manufacturing manager is walking out. Nobody running manufacturing. It's just a disaster waiting to happen, you know? So when Byron walked into my office, office. I said, you got the job and your job is to run manufacturing. And this guy was straight out of high school from two days ago and you're going to get minimum wage, which was $5 an hour at the time. I think I was paying like $30 an hour to the manufacturing manager. And I said, just go in there into the manufacturing plant. You got, you know, all these people, these old guys, you know, everybody's reporting to you. And he was only 18. And then he, he left. And then I didn't see him for like a week. And then I'm like in another meeting and he opens the door and he sticks his head in and he says, Mr. Redford, I can't believe you're paying me to do this. So manufacturing was running beautifully. There were, there were absolutely no hiccups. Everything was great. And he sticks his head in and he says, Mr. Redford, I can't believe that 
you paying me to do this? No, he meant it was just too easy. So then, you know, I don't know, a couple of years later, I went to engineering school. So he went to San Luis Obispo. Four years later, he calls me back. And he says, okay, I'm done. What's next? So I hired him back, but this time as a CTO of, of my company. And we worked together for many, many years. I don't know, about 20 years we worked together. He's been the CEO. Every time I built another company, he would be the CTO. You know, Who hires a guy who just graduated from high school yesterday to run your entire manufacturing? Yep. Thank you, Peter, for sharing. We already have heard about your lawsuit against the world's biggest software and hardware companies, which you successfully won. What was the biggest challenge in your life besides mentioned lawsuit? And how did you overcome it? What is your success story? My biggest challenge was how to live my entire life on my own terms. So it's more of a life story rather than a single challenge. You know, this is something that I face every single day, being free, you know, being not, not being somebody's cog in the machine, you know. And what made it possible, got on, on that track, was that I always worked. You know, since I was 14 years old, I always had a paying job. I literally had hundreds of jobs in my life already, you know. And the interesting thing about being 14 years old and having money, and I'm talking like not just an allowance, you know, but real money, you know, enough money to buy a car. It allowed me to do what I wanted. You know, like my friends would be taking their girlfriends to the movies. I would be taking my girlfriends to, you know, horseback riding or I would rent, you know, things like that. Or we would go on a trip somewhere and that cost, you know, a few thousand dollars. That really, really demonstrated to me that money can set you free. It makes you, gives you much more options you know, than, than not having any money. When I was just 17, I already had a beautiful VW bus camper, you know, one of those pop top campers with a kitchen and a bed. And imagine wow. having a bed on wheels sort of when you're 17 years old. And, you know, with that camper, I was able to travel during the summer. I would think 12 weeks, I would travel around the whole country, including Alaska, every state, every national park. It was just an amazing, empowering experience, you know, that taught me to be fearless and independent. To me, this is an example of how work makes you free. Instead right. of sitting around watching TV, I would actually be working, even to the detriment of my grades. You know, I thought work, work was more important even than school at the time. Wow. This is another incredible story. Thanks for sharing. Amazing. If you like this interview, please like and share this video with your friends. If you want to be notified about my upcoming guests, subscribe and click the bell below. If you want to know how to win Bitcoin jackpot, watch this interview until the very end. Peter, you have been a CEO at several successful companies for over 30 years. What are the top three mistakes a CEO should avoid based on your own experience? It's a very short list. Being arrogant is one, probably the most important thing. Losing focus, trying to do too many things at once, especially after you get funding, you feel invincible and, and you think you can do 20 things. Even IBM cannot do 20 things at the same time. And taking people for granted, that is probably the easiest trap to fall into. I mean, this is why people get divorced, for example. This is why people leave companies because they feel like they're not appreciated. Bonus mistake would be like not being nice to waiters. Besides driving sports cars, what else do you like to do outside of work? What are your hobbies? I love running and biking in the mountains, which is not easy. I also love eating in amazing restaurants. Over the years, I met most of the chefs in the best restaurants in Silicon Valley and San Francisco. So, you know, I go to these restaurants. I don't have to order. I just sit down and they bring me these amazing dishes. They're like showing up. Let's imagine how good it is when the chef is showing up, making you some amazing dish to show up. Like sort of like going to a Japanese restaurant and saying, oh, umakase, which means whatever the chef thinks is best. I also built a waterfall on my property that if they were in the wilderness, it would be on the map. It's that big. My house is like a botanical garden. But most of all, I really enjoy meeting interesting people and spending time with interesting people. To me, an interesting person is even better than an interesting book. And it's kind of like a book in a way. And you know, you meet an interesting person, you get into their head, you also get into their amazing network a lot of times of people they introduce you to. And it just never ends. How do you keep your energy high and what is your morning routine? For some reason, I only need four hours of sleep. I, I re rarely get more than four hours. I wake up around four o'clock in the morning. These days, it's easy to start working because I can just do it on my phone. You know, I start reviewing the details of my projects. And there's always something to review, you know, maybe a contract or whatever. I never eat breakfast. I started that years ago in the 80s. In fact, I skipped breakfast to save time and then I got used to it and I found I don't need it. You know, I just have a nice lunch and a nice dinner. So I never eat breakfast and I usually cook my own food. What do you want to do in the next five to 10 years? What is your five to 10 year vision, objective and 
mission. Well, always thinking about some inventions, but right now I'm just looking forward to selling my house in Silicon Valley. It's on the market actually, and moving to Maui. So we already have a, a house picked out on Maui. And as soon as we sell the house here, we'll be moving to Maui with, with two big German shepherds. You know, everything I do these days is virtual. It became virtual. And this lately actually, you know, it became even sort of the way to go. So when I build teams right now, I almost automatically assume that everybody's going to be all over the place, not not local. Other than living next to a nice beach, everything else will pretty much remain the same as it is right now. You hold over 40 patents. Why is being a contributor important? It's because I find satisfaction in visualizing something, something new, and seeing it come to life. You know, I would not be a very happy painter, for example, because paintings just hang on the wall. I'm like a painter that wants the painting to actually do something. And I just really enjoy when the blank piece of paper comes to life with some new invention that makes people's life easier or whatever. But I also appreciate the financial rewards, you know, that contributing is able to provide. As we know, gratefulness is the opposite feeling from fear. What or who are you grateful for today? I am grateful that my parents raised me as a free-range kid. I actually read a, an article, I don't know, a couple years ago about free-range kids. And that's how I know what it's called now. But, you know, I never had a babysitter. You know, my parents simply would leave my brother and I alone. And we would be able to stay in the house. We would be able to go outside. We got into all kinds of trouble that my parents don't even know about. I never had to ask permission. For example, seven years old. I mean, I could just go and get on a bus and go to the other side of town. My parents had no idea I was even doing it, but I would do it. I would get on the bus without a ticket. And sometimes I get busted for it too. But, you know, you're just a kid. What are they going to do? Right. Right? Being able to live like that as a kid really allowed me to face a lot of challenges early on. And it taught me how to be responsible. But being responsible, it doesn't mean that you're afraid of everything. Because, right. you know, then you're really responsible. You end up being paralyzed. But, you know, what it taught me was how to separate things that are important and things that are not important. So these days, so it became like really easy for me to not worry about things that I don't need to worry about. Because I know people who worry about everything. And right. they basically dilute their ability to worry about things that really matter. They don't have any time left over to worry about things that really matter. You know, I'm the kind of guy that drives a Ferrari and leaves the key in the ignition always because I just don't worry about it being stolen. What's the worst thing that can happen? Okay, it gets stolen, but what are the chances of it getting stolen? Very small because it's like a beacon. You can't go very far with it without getting pulled over because cops will be looking for a red Ferrari. It's sort of like practicing trust. You know, you just don't worry about things you don't, you shouldn't be worried about. And knowing what those things are really goes a long way to giving you more time to worry about the things that matter. That's awesome, Peter. Thank you so much. In 2017, you founded a gaming platform, Trivi, which broadcasts in celebrity-driven content with a large Bitcoin jackpot for its players. I am a big Bitcoin enthusiast and love everything related to Bitcoin. Could you share with us where we can find gaming platform Trivi and how we can win Coin Jackpot? Trivi is a 24-7 variant of Jeopardy. I think everybody knows what Jeopardy is. It's a trivia game on television, you know, where like 15 million people watch every day sometime. Well, we are 24-7. We're every hour. We're like CNN of trivia. You can actually play it right now and win money. Many players won thousands of dollars. You go to www.trivitv.com and you can download it from there. Just click on the App Store button. We are just now coming out of beta and very soon you'll be, we'll be launching with huge huge hourly jackpots. So the jackpots are going to be in the thousands and that's every single hour. And all you have to do is answer 20 questions, right? And so let's just say that you're the only one who wins the jackpot and you get your $10,000. We actually give it to you in fractional Bitcoins and it sits in your wallet and you can you can cash out immediately. Or if you think that uh, that uh, Bitcoin is going to go up, you keep it in the wallet and you watch it and you watch it go up. Bitcoin is selling at $60,000 and you've got your $10,000 in, in your wallet and tomorrow Bitcoin is selling for $120, your $10,000 just became $20,000. It's like that. So you have eight seconds for each question. The thing that we invented, which is really profound actually, when you consider all the implications, is that we let you see the questions ahead of time. The game itself, the live game, you know, where, you, where you're competing with all the other players at the same time, that's five minutes long. So you have five minutes to answer those questions. But mm -hmm. the 55 minutes before that is called the pregame. During that time, we let you see all of the questions that 
that are going to be asked. So we pick 11 categories at random. Each one has approximately 20, 30 questions. So you uh-huh. have about 270 questions to look at, to study, mm-hmm. and 20 of those will be picked at random during the test. So, so you look at the 270 and then 20 of those actually show up at random during the, the actual quiz. We have two revenue sources. One is we sell extra lives. An extra life is something that allows you to get a question, provide an incorrect answer and still stay in the game. Without any extra life, if you get one question wrong, you're out. You can still play, but you no longer share the jackpot. But you can use up to 10 extra lives per game. And we sell those extra lives for $1 each. You know, as you keep winning more and more, you know, the, the number of extra lives you can use goes down. So eventually you can only use one extra life. But right. then if you lose a lot of games in the future, you can, you can go back up to 10 again, you know, depending on how many you lose. So it varies uh, depending on your success rate. The other revenue source is what we call trivia ads. And that's an invention that, of ours. Trivia ads are ads that appear as trivia questions. So advertisers basically are able to, for example, a Tesla could, could create a trivia ad that is a picture of one of their cars. Let's say it's a Model X, you know, with the doors that go up. So the question is the picture of the car. The answer is Model X. But you have four multiple choices, Model X, Model W, Model S, you know. So if you know that it's Model X, you win. You get that question right. Now, right. how do you know that it's Model X? Well, because the 55 minutes during the pregame, that trivia also shows up as one of the trivia questions you get to study ahead of time. Now, the ads I actually studied because knowing about the Model X will help you win the jackpot. I bet you thought this many times. Gosh, if I knew it before, I would do it better or differently. What advice would you give to your younger self? Other than perhaps being more humble, I really can't think of any regrets. But that's really what you're asking. Do you have any regrets? I honestly cannot think of any. Maybe if I think harder, I would think of something, but nothing really comes to mind. Wow, what an advice. Thank you, Peter, for your inventions and contribution. It was a pleasure to have you a guest at the Contributor Show. I hope our viewers enjoyed this interview and learned how to raise money and win a Bitcoin jackpot. If you like this interview and found it helpful, please like and share. If you want to be notified about upcoming guests, subscribe and click the bell. And by the way, who else should I interview? Leave a comment below. Thanks for watching the Contributor Show. Stay tuned.